welcome to all of you to this talk show on uh, the legends of neurology. And today we have with us Professor Sanjeev B. Thomas. Uh, Professor Thomas is actually now the director of uh, the Institute for Cognition and Communicative Disorders and was formerly the head of department of the Sri Chitra Tirunal of uh, Sri Chitra Tirunal Institute for Medical Sciences and Technology. He was the head of department of neurology and was in charge of the R. Madhavan Nair Center for Comprehensive Epilepsy Care. So retired as the chairperson of the department in August 2021 and has continued to remain active in both academics and clinical research now as the director of uh, ICONS, which is an institute which is located in uh, Trivandrum and Palakkad in Kerala. Uh, a very warm welcome to you, sir. And uh, I'm sure you would probably not prefer being referred to as a legend of neurology because knowing you personally, I know that sir is a man of not only supreme, but also subtle confidence, uh, but was also someone who inspires humility just based upon your interactions with him. So I'm not too sure whether sir would prefer the use of this word legends, but sir, a very warm welcome to you. And uh, definitely we would have preferred to have this as a chai pe charcha kind of an environment rather than a virtual environment. But I think... Uh, Probably the most important reason why this particular talk show is being conducted is because you know very well that as a leader, you, te you tend to inspire people. And if you can inspire a person to uh, dream more, to do more, learn more, and become more, as uh, quoted by uh, the, one of the former presidents of uh, the United States, John Quincy Adams, I think this would aptly sum up uh, what Professor Sanjeev Thomas is to the neurology uh, diaspora of the country as well as abroad. And uh, on this note, I would like to welcome you, sir. And, uh, you know, to start off with this uh, talk show straight away, I would like to pose a very difficult question to you. Now, this question was posed to me by one of uh, uh, the very eminent neurologists uh, uh, in a, an international meeting when I just introduced myself to him. I would not take his name. But I found that question extremely difficult to answer. And I thought I'd uh, probably just put it across to you because it would probably give us a perspective on how your journey began into clinical medicine and neurology. So in simple terms, why did you prefer to become a doctor and why clinical neurology is what we would like to know first of all. Uh, thank you, Ram, for the kind words and uh, of introduction. And uh, at the outset, I must uh, place on record uh, my sincere thanks to the Dean Academy of Neurology, particularly the president of uh, Dr. Nirmal Surya for initiating this uh, new uh, program of uh, meeting uh, people who have been uh, in and around for quite some time uh, as uh, the so-called legends. As Ram was mentioning, I really was uh, quite uh, puzzled as to uh, how far that term will be appropriate uh, for it. The merit that I see is that I had been in and around for quite some time. And uh, I had the privilege and opportunity to you know, work with a large number of uh, eminent people in India in, who are working in neurology, who have been, uh, who have made great names and also who have contributed substantially to the progress of neurology in this country. So these are my credentials, I would say, to participate in this program. And uh, I also, as you are mentioning, I was also thinking that this may be an opportunity to look back on uh, how I ended up in what I am and uh, see how uh, different uh, dying factors dynamically affect us and ultimately we become what <laughs> we are. Yeah. And many a times uh, we may not be able to capture the, the true factors as in statistical analysis. All that may be significant, maybe not costly related, but <laughs> maybe only an association. So that possibility is also there. Right, uh, your uh, first question is, uh, as you said, is really a tough question. Why did I become a doctor? And uh, what uh, made me become a neurologist? 
is uh, uh, I didn't uh, expect this question, so I have to really think back. Uh, I would say that, you know, as a child, as any child, you know, we always read books and we read a book about, uh, you know, people who have uh, made a lot of uh, contributions and uh, things. One of the persons who had uh, influenced me as a child was Albert Schweitzer, who was a, a medical professional working in uh, Africa at that time and uh, had uh, helped in the health care of that people and eventually he was uh, given Nobel Prize and uh, when I read his book what surprised me was that he had uh, some four or five PhDs before he decided to do his uh, medicine and uh, when he decided to go to Africa he decided to do the medicine and then uh, go there. A very accomplished uh, musician, scientist and other ways, he had uh, no hesitation in uh, venturing into a new area if he has a will to do certain work. Probably this is one of the biographies which had uh, influenced me as a small child and uh, maybe kindled the dream of becoming a, a doctor. And uh, that may be one of the factors and uh, of course the doctors other uh, there are many other uh, factors which uh, uh, attract us towards this career which is a noble profession and uh, opportunity to work in a different way so there may be but this may be one of the main factors as for uh, neurology um, well I, I do not know how i really got interested uh, when i was doing my md in medicine I don't think I was uh, overwhelmingly interested in uh, neurology. Uh, I, as any graduate in, from Kerala Medical uh, Kerala State, we always dream of joining a medical college. At that time, only government medical colleges were there, okay. and uh, so we were. Uh, we have to write the public service uh, ec uh, commission examination, PSC examinations, and then uh, get into the rank list and after that get selected for appointment. So I had uh, written almost, uh, you know, respiratory medicine, infectious disease, then um, uh, neurology, cardiology, uh, many of those uh, subjects which are applicable for a general medicine candidate. And um, I don't think I, I, I was not successful uh, in uh, getting a selection in a, neurology or cardiology, but I got selected in infectious disease. That was another uh, thing. I later worked also in infectious disease for a short while, uh, but that is after I took my idea. Uh, but however, I should say that, you know, the, the art and beauty of neurology was uh, exposed to us in a very wonderful way by Professor Mother Sodhanan. Uh, who at that time had just uh, joined my medical college. I studied in Toronto Medical College for my MD. And uh, as most people know that Professor Madhusudhanan is one of the best uh, neurology teachers in this country or even if you take it on an international level. His extraordinary skills in uh, taking history, analyzing it and uh, making localizations had uh, amazed us as uh, young medical graduates. And uh, most of the afternoons, uh, uh, we, our classmates used to go around and uh, see cases uh, with him and uh, enjoy the uh, clinical uh, treatise. And uh, this was something which uh, I would say that uh, uh, interested me in the neurology. And, um, Neurology as a science has always been also quite uh, uh, interesting. At one point uh, there was a, a question, I was one time uh, asked uh, to address the new uh, candidates to the Sri Chitra Tirunal, that is those who have just joined for DM Neurology, DM Cardiology and uh, MCH, every subject and the director is uh, addressing and all the 
heads of the departments are uh, uh, supposed to say a few words. Uh, I, I was uh, uh, trying to see what I can say. Then I thought that, you know, I will say, what is the most uh, important part of a stethoscope? And uh, so when I asked this question to everybody, you know, I, of course, this is a cunning question. Uh, so I didn't expect everybody else to answer that. So maybe the chest piece, maybe the ear piece, the tubings, various things. But I said that, you know, what lies between the two ear piece is the most uh, important part of the stethoscope. So that is our brain. So <laughs> I think our brain is the most important part in any clinical field. Incidentally, uh, I, uh, when I joined, I was a medical student in uh, uh, Alapi Medical College where I did my MPBS. Uh, I joined the third year, that is when we start going to the clinics. Now it's a very exciting time. We wear the stethoscope and move around. One uh, day I came back from the hospital and I was uh, sitting in the, uh, the, uh, the mess hall, as we used to call. One of the mess boys came to me and told me, uh, sir, you should not wear this stethoscope. Uh, why? I said, why? Uh, because this tube is uh, transparent and uh, it shows that uh, there is nothing in it. We are uh, thinking that, you know, this tube contains a lot of sophisticated instruments which uh, uh, decipher all the secrets of illness to the patients. So don't wear this one. So stethoscope, uh, I have two memories, one of these two memories. So doctors have, every doctor has an important role to play and uh, that way, everybody uh, has an important. Oh. However, uh, neurology is a fascinating subject, and uh, it is uh, something which uh, is just opening up. In future, we will have a long. Uh, uh, maybe it is going to be more exciting to see what is going to come. True. Anybody who actually goes through the text of your presidential oration, which you delivered as an I, as the IN president at Raipur. Uh, would be aware of your thoughts into how clinical practice is evolving in our country. Uh, neurology practice at the crossroads, if I can remember. So, uh, I mean, I, I mean, the audience is quite sure from this opening remarks from Sanjeev sir that you know he's a picture of sublime confidence and humility at each and every step. So, uh, I mean, we all are waiting to be inspired by sir and what his experience has been and what his vision is for the future. But sir, uh, we just wanted to know from you, I mean, in your journey, you talked about Professor Madhusudan and who are the other inspirational figures uh, in your journey into not only clinical neurology, but also epilepsy. We know that you have traveled across the world, gained fellowships, and if you want to put all those inspirational figures in a nutshell, who would you really like to you know, bring out at the moment? Yeah. The person who introduced me to epilepsy is uh, my mentor, Professor P.K. Mohan, who was my head of the department at that time. And uh, he, he was a man of a uh, few words. And uh, I must say that, you know, when I joined uh, DM Neurology, uh, he was a very tough person to handle with. Uh, he will not speak much, but uh, he will be asking very probing questions, which are uh, really difficult to answer unless we go and read quite uh, uh, extensively on the subject. And uh, he always expected us to take that extra mile and uh, go into greater depth of uh, the subject and uh, analyze it. His uh, symptom analysis and uh, his ability to dissect out uh, the clinical nuances was extraordinary. It was always very difficult to uh, uh, convince him on any point uh, which we try to say. Uh, as a young uh, recruit, after passing out, you know, I was, uh, as I was earlier mentioning, as I passed out, uh, I was uh, uh, posted in the Infectious Disease Department of the Neurology, uh, Medical College, where I worked as a 
lecturer in uh, infectious disease for one year and at that time uh, fortunately i had some opportunity to teach neurology to a lot of students uh, some of them are now faculty in different places and uh, when i came back uh, the, in between an opening come up, came up into random uh, sri chitra dirinal institute and uh, i applied for it and i was uh, selected as one of the uh, faculty and i had some uh, before joining i had some uh, meetings with sir about what he expects and all those things but leaving up that apart uh, after joining i wanted to do some small research and some analysis of papers and all those things any type of analysis any type of study i put across to dr mohan he will oh, that is not uh, that did not be there some problems he will find out finally i was so frustrated i had to tell him sir some nobel prize winning thesis or topics only will excite you <laughs> i can't think of those kind of things i will try to do some small things and then so he was in other ways you know trying to uh, help us to think in greater depth understand the limitations of what i am trying to do or what i to do actually he was it was a good exercise other uh, if, if if that kind of a uh, cross checking was not there i don't think i would have uh, planned for uh, more advanced ways of uh, studying things and uh, so that is how uh, dr mohan had uh, influence to me and uh, when i joined uh, uh, the sri chitra tirunal institute as a as an assistant professor dr mohan was looking after the epilepsy group uh, in chitra we had uh, the subspeciality program at that time in 1986 onwards and uh, i joined in sri chitra in 1990 january and uh, i think in a couple of months after my joining there he told me you go to the epilepsy clinic and uh, look after that and uh, that was the last time he came for the epilepsy clinic so he gave away his uh, interest his uh, passion for the subject to me so that you know i can work in that area and uh, develop it so it was a great opportunity and uh, support and uh, the confidence with which uh, sir had uh, entrusted it to me was uh, great and uh, i was uh, encouraged to do studies and uh, the published things that was uh, even from that time and uh, one of the first papers uh, is uh, with mohan sir and that is uh, on uh, what is it on postal review for epilepsy <laughs> very right. very very unexpected and uh, different type of uh, you know today we have telemedicine in a very big way true and uh, uh, this is in 1990 this was already being practiced and in 86 onward this was being practiced postal reviews we so he was suggesting you know and i also thought it's a good idea to review how far postal reviews can be useful in the epilepsy care and uh, we wrote uh, did some analysis how many of them had to turn back to the hospital how many were lost and kind of things and uh, this was uh, written up and uh, we submitted this to uh, the international epilepsy congress in oslo in uh, 1993 where it was accepted as a poster and uh, i had the privilege opportunity to attend this and this was my first uh, overseas travel and uh, that was also an exciting experience so sir has uh, been a great influence for me to me uh, in my career in the, my formative period and uh, i think uh, his uh, contributions were i, I should uh, uh, acknowledge it with great respect his uh, contribution uh, another person who uh, influenced me at that time Yes, I have often told this to many of my colleagues, so it may be a repetition for them. He is uh, Professor Silvanius from uh, Umeå University in Sweden. So when I joined, I wanted to do a fellowship in some uh, institutions and uh, where uh, epilepsy surgery is being done 
So I started writing to different uh, institutions in UK, Canada, uh, USA, and uh, Professor K. S. Money, uh, who was uh, earlier uh, yeah, the professor and head of the department of NIMHANS. Uh, in a uh, meeting told me that, you know, why don't you contact uh, Dr. Sylvanius? He is a very <laughs> eminent person and he might uh, give you some opportunities. So I took the address from Professor K.S. Mani, Dr. Sylvanius address and uh, wrote the letter. In those days only we had, you know, the postal letters. And he told me, if you are coming to Oslo, why don't you come to Sweden, Umea and spend a few days with us? I said, yes, I will come and uh, I did not know who he is, so, but I took the ticket and all those things and uh, I went to the conference and uh, attended a session which uh, he was chairing, so that, you know, after the session is over, I went and met him and said, I am Sanjeev Thomas and uh, he said, you, I am going back today, after the conference is over, you come over to you, you know, and uh, then we will meet. So I went there, it was a train trip from Oslo to Stockholm and from there to Umeå by flight. And Umeå is uh, at the border with the Arctic zone. So it has a lot of peculiarities in that place. Incidentally, the aircrafts uh, that land there stand on a hot plate like thing so that the ground doesn't freeze and the okay. aircrafts don't uh, get stuck there. So completely a different, a uh, lot of uh, interesting experiences in Umeå. Anyway, Professor Sylvanius had come to the airport, picked me up and he put me up in his house for one week, five days or six days. Now looking back, you know, for a Westerner to accommodate a, a person from outside in their own house is something uh, unimaginable. Nobody does that. So he has really come out of the way to help me from a faraway country and uh, he took me around the hospital and uh, showed, uh, showed the epilepsy programs which they are doing surgery and a few days and then I came back to India. And uh, when before I left, uh, he promised that, you know, he can uh, take me as a fellow in uh, epilepsy uh, in the next year. So that is how, uh, and I also had uh, in the simultaneously an invitation or agreement to do the fellowship uh, in uh, uh, NIH in uh, uh, Bethesda, USA. So that's also a very premier institution and I didn't want to miss the opportunity. So I split the fellowship between these two institutions, half at uh, uh, NIH and uh, half at uh, uh, UMIO and uh, we did it. The experience in uh, NIH is quite uh, different from the experience in, uh, in, uh, in UMIO. So, you know, clinical center, CC, is a yeah. 10 or 12 story building that is just uh, over one of the metro stations. And uh, you travel on the metro, get into that, there are so many rooms and you are assigned to a small cubicle uh, where with a chair and a bench and uh, you do your work and uh, it is amazing to see that you know uh, the next room may be or another per room may be a Nobel laureate uh, there were at that time at least three or four Nobel laureates uh, working in NIH whom we used to meet in uh, different uh, uh, occasions Professor Mark Hallett was the head of the clinical neurology side at that time and Bill Theodore uh, was the head of clinical epileptology and uh, I had a lot of exposure to uh, telemed uh, EEG at that time at the way they called it uh, nowadays we call it video EEG and uh, that was my first exposure to all those uh, sophisticated things and uh, what are testing done by you know the stock persons in this uh, all the papers written by them it was a great experience so that is uh, i should also say you know how the ambience influences you i think this is something which uh, we in india miss a lot when we go there uh, they expect you to have no hassles in your work they will provide every facility for us to work 
at the same time it is expected that you know we do our work extremely well and uh, come out with very good uh, results so you cannot say that you know i did not have that or i did not have this and uh, this person didn't come for today's this thing these are all uh, to be sorted out at our level and the work has to be done or your whatever target you have placed has to be finished so a lot of pressure to complete the work and uh, do that uh, that is uh, the way the american system works people don't uh, uh, you can see them running around with a coffee mug and doing all sorts of things simultaneously you go to you uh, sweden everybody is relaxed with no hurry take your time what is the and uh, very relaxed uh, environment so these are different uh, environments yeah. i think i have talked too much about all those uh, no, no, no. things <laughs> no, it's, it's it's very useful to know because you know it very often happens that uh, young neurologists who visit these foreign universities uh, either or an academic or a research fellowship or a clinical fellowship for that matter they tend to get overwhelmed by the uh, by the very presence of these giants and uh, you know it's perhaps having that self confidence and instilling those abilities in your uh, uh, fellows as well as your juniors is what would actually pave the way to increase these kind of interactions and enable them to make the best of these kind of interactions as well so thank you sir for those inputs uh, now with regard to clinical neurology it, it's a question which was there because with regard to epilepsy itself i have personally seen that your interests have been quite diverse with regard to societal aspects of epilepsy uh, pseudep epilepsy surgery but what actually picked your interest in uh, women with epilepsy especially when it came to understanding about uh, preconceptional counseling as well as uh, postnatal management and looking at fetal outcomes in women with epilepsy what exactly picked your interest in this area yeah ram that is a very good question uh, what uh, had actually uh, driven me to this topic is the consecutive uh, a few cases of uh, congenital malformations in uh, pregnant women who had uh, who with epilepsy it is not uh, that every day, that same day they came uh, they came uh, maybe 2 3 weeks or one month apart two or three people had come women had come to the clinic and uh, uh, one lady particularly from ambalapura i remember she had a lot of questions about uh, you know why this is happening and what way this can be prevented and uh, what steps uh, st uh, what should you do and all those things which i honestly speaking i did not have much answer i didn't know how to answer all those uh, questions uh we give the standard uh, responses uh, which are uh, not uh, very convincing and uh, probably not to the best answers but actually that helped me to think okay this is an area where uh, we need to have some clear clarity and uh, how to go about it and uh, this is how uh thought of uh, doing more work in the area of uh, women with epilepsy and epilepsy and pregnancy in particular so this is uh, this was uh, probably in uh, 95 96 time and um, then we started uh, working and the kerala registry of epilepsy and pregnancy was started in 1998 uh i think uh, just before that there was an international meeting epilepsy congress in which uh, we had uh, presented some data so we had some opportunity to interact with uh, those who are working in the same field from abroad so that also helped us to develop a sort of a registry kind of how to go about it and within a long term plan uh, i would say that you know more than my research planning it was just it so happened that you know we decided to do a very long term follow up rather than just uh, maintaining only a short term follow up which was very useful to us as you now realize uh, we have one of the longest uh, follow up of uh, children who are exposed to anti epileptic uh, drugs and uh, today i am happy to say that you know uh, one of our uh, papers on uh, the long term outcome of children that is up to 21 years of age 
has been accepted for publication. It was uh, I got the message uh, yesterday uh, for uh, from the Seashore Journal. So it may be in a couple of months it will come. So we have now follow up of some of the children as old as 21 years of age. And uh, that kind of a long term follow up over 15 years, 20 years at the moment, no series is available anywhere else in the world. Sure. So that way, you know, we had a very commanding uh, position in our uh, research, not because of uh, extraordinary equipments or extraordinary facilities, but it was a foresight to follow up all these children. Uh, and the ambience in uh, Kerala is also favorable. Most patients will fall, come for follow up. If they don't come, we can contact them and uh, encourage them to come. So the, uh, the loss to follow up uh, is uh, very low. So we, whereas I think uh, most of my colleagues who are working in other states in India say that it, it becomes much more difficult to maintain long term contact with uh, uh, patients and their family. But in Kerala, although there are hurdles, uh, it is still uh, possible. And uh, you also know from uh, the, your uh, memory clinic and behavioral neurology clinic uh, that you know long term follow up uh, you are having a very uh, very large cohort which is being followed up for how many years now 10 years 15 yeah, years? 11 years now. 11 years more than 10 years so that kind of follow up is uh, i don't think any any other group in india have that kind of a follow up so we must uh, look at uh, opportunities uh, to fully capitalize on our advantages and uh, do very long term follow -up. Ram and his team and uh, his predecessors have done an extraordinary work in this area. And uh, this they are the contributions are respected and quoted across the world. And uh, I'm very happy that you know, I could associate with all of them uh, at some point of time. Yeah, the Kerala registry for epilepsy in has actually set a benchmark with regard to any national or international registry and uh, I understand that the work from the KREP has been quoted in many publications and is one of the most uh, cited publications are from Sanjeev's uh, work. Uh, sir, I mean, as a neurologist who is, you know, at the crossroads deciding on taking up an academic career versus research career versus clinical practice, uh, I mean, I, we agree that it's largely the decision is individualized because everyone has a different perspective to how they would like to approach their career. Uh, any tips from your side with regard to, you know, like young neurologists taking such a decision? I mean, there are clinical neurologists who enter into private practice and uh, are continuing to remain excellent academicians as well. Uh, are, are there any tips from your side with regard to how one should approach such a decision to join an institute, whether it is a state government institute and a national government institute, uh, and, or enter into private practice? And if so, once you know that once somebody enters into a national institute or state government institute, there is a constant pressure to teach as well as uh, to do high quality research. So what are your tips to such a person? would want to take such a decision you know when i passed my md medicine uh, i joined a private hospital a small uh, hospital uh, around uh, 200 kilometers uh, north of uh, trivandrum it is on a, one of the hilly areas kanyarapalli it's a very old hospital i was the only physician there was a gen gynecologist so i spent a year working there so as a generalist, what I do, and then this is not an academic institution, just a private hospital. And uh, I had some uh, flavor of uh, what I can do in that uh, atmosphere. I enjoyed very much uh, the work, but uh, I thought that, you know, this is something not uh, exactly I would like to do. Uh, later, I was mentioning uh, that, you know, before joining Sri Chitra, I worked in uh, Trivandrum Medical College as a lecturer. Um, so the scope of uh, a lecturer's post in uh, Trivandrum Medical College or any medical college in the Kerala state combines the opportunity to do fairly good private practice and uh, practice 
and if you want you can uh, maintain an academic uh, um, effort, uh, outcome uh, however uh, the environment is not very conducive for uh, a detailed research because the emphasis is more on uh, delivery of care so the large number of patients they attend they have to be taken care of uh, there is no control on the number of uh, patients, inpatients, outpatients, your uh, duties, all those things. You are primarily looking after uh, uh, patients and uh, if you have some spare time or if you are extraordinary interest, go and do some research. That kind of, uh, uh, so in that atmosphere, it is difficult to devote more time to uh, research. And uh, this was something which was unique for Skichitra because uh, the, the emphasis on teaching and uh, research is much more in uh, uh, major institutions, premier institutions like All India Institute, Enhance or Sri Chitra, where people, uh, the, the government expects us to, to spend a lot of time on research. So that devoted time is there. And uh, in our department, as you know, we had uh, several experiments on how to protect uh, the research uh, time for a faculty, so giving them exclusive windows to do research, giving them opportunity to go abroad and do fellowships and uh, various kinds of uh, enhancing your skills. Besides, we also have a good uh, biostatistics, uh, interdisciplinary surveys, and a lot of other support which helps us to carry out research without much uh, uh, you know difficulty when compared to other institutions so if somebody is uh, very seriously interested in research i would say that you know a protected environment is an easier way to do research rather than uh, trying to struggle in a general setting to set up a full quality but if someone is doing that they are really extraordinary great people and there are examples for that and i'm not saying that so they are extraordinary people for ordinary persons who do not uh, have that kind of skills i think this environment is really helpful yeah i think it's as i said it's probably inherent to one's personality whether one's refers to remain focused or multi-focused in terms of their approach uh, but I, I mean, uh, one thing that's admirable, with, I mean, uh, given your career is the fact that you have always remained, uh, you know, the national and international voice for epilepsy care in India, among others. And uh, I think your uh, achievements in terms of uh, being awarded the ambassador of epilepsy award at the International League Against Epilepsy uh, and your various uh, leadership positions in Indian Epilepsy Association and Indian Epilepsy Society, they are a testimony to this fact. Now, uh, how important is it for a neurologist to really go in for uh, this kind of an approach, you know, holding administrative positions in various national bodies, uh, guiding their juniors? How, how focused does one need to be early on in his career to really going along? Or does it happen naturally? I mean, uh, obviously, once you're doing good quality work, you are recognized and you are called for and you're asked to join these bodies, but how important is it to be a voice for, uh, in your case, let us say epilepsy care in India and across the world as you have been? I think this is a very, very important matter. And uh, in general, you know, our uh, approach had been that we will listen to the Westerners, what they have done, what they have experienced, and uh, uh, we will be the, listeners and they will be the speakers that i think is not right we also have uh, in one of uh, my edit i think my first editorial for the indian academy of neurology journal annals uh, i had uh, discussed this uh, matter when there are so many good journals uh, on neurology in the world why should we have a uh, annals Annals was at that time dying and uh, hardly it was coming out for more than a year, it was closed. And uh, so at that is the uh, situation when which I was asked to take over. So when I look at it, you know, I, and this is, I think this is valuable for everyone. And uh, 
we have the largest population or nearly second largest population uh, in the world in our country any neurologist in india would have seen 10 times the same condition that so. any anybody else maybe it a stroke or epilepsy or infectious disease demyelinating disease anything because of the sheer crowd any neurologist would have seen don't we have anything to tell others about our uh, data i think we have much more so we definitely need a platform on which we can present our data present our experience and talk to the world so that is where the indian academy of neurology or annals of indian academy of neurology or neurology india all these journals which come out from india become relevant what we need to be uh, uh, taking care of what is that we should not compromise on standards it is very easy for others to point out that you know you have that lack when you have not take control for that you have not control for this you know these kind of uh, things you know that is where we become diffident and we lose our confidence and uh, we feel that you know our data will never be accepted our uh, quite true yeah and uh, this has to be fought we have to uh, say that you know we have a uh, uh, different experience and uh, we should not hesitate from saying that we have a, a different experience just now i will give you an example i was telling that our paper on a, a 21 year outcome of children had been accepted this was uh, the data was being compiled uh, in uh, 19 2020 and 2021 beginning so in Feb uh, december january february december 2020 and all i was uh, quite worried you know how i will complete this because of the covid you know no patient will be coming to the hospital no we cannot invite anybody to come to the hospital they uh, it was all shut down so my uh, uh, my dream of publishing the the uh, latest data became very difficult so we started writing letters to them we formed a team finally who can visit them at their house and gather some data we cannot do that for the entire state so we decided that we will do it for trivandrum district and take out all the patients who live in trivandrum district send them as a uh, team two persons so social workers were trained to go to their house and look so we collected data nevertheless the total uh, follow up was only around 45% of the cohort that was born 21 years back so 40 55% of the patients who had uh, were born in 21 years back could be followed up half of them could be followed up other half could not be followed up and we said that you know because of the covid we could not uh, and our protocol had to be changed because the neuropsychological tests which had to be done at a hospital could not be done because they are going home and uh, these people are not trained to do those things so some of yeah. the tests had to be abandoned so uh, protocol had to be modified so this all we wrote then say that you know because of covid we had to change the protocol and uh, data is truncated in many patients and uh, data is a uh, different format home based data but of course there were a lot of uh, difficulties uh, in um, getting it uh, uh, approved uh, tender went uh, two revisions and then only it got accepted but finally we could get it accepted that's because uh, we know we were quite uh, vociferous in uh, saying that you know this is uh, very properly collected data and uh, i don't think uh, they can uh, refuse that that kind of a situation thank you sir uh, i think it's perhaps the gist of the message is that no challenge is insurmountable when it comes to clinical research and it, all that it requires is the focus and the dedication as uh, rightly demonstrated in your work uh, but I also noticed, you know, uh, apart from women with epilepsy and other aspects of epilepsy, uh, so an, a topic which is close to your heart has always been the social aspects of epilepsy. And uh, 
I still remember your uh, uh, attempt to initiate school healthcare and epilepsy and uh, uh, to conduct surveys and to how to rapidly diagnose epilepsy in school health, the very fact that it, it could be probably underdiagnosed among children with epilepsy. So, I mean, I, find, I found that very inspiring. Uh, could you just tell us a few words about how you dwell into the social aspects I, of epilepsy? Like I, Ram, you should tell about the school epilepsy program because you are one of the leaders in that. <laughs> no, but the very thought, the very process that you could probably get epilepsy care directly at the doorstep of schools yeah. was something inspiring. I mean, definitely people would like to know about that. Yeah, uh, the reason we thought in that uh, direction was, you know, many children are not getting proper treatment and uh, the treatment gap among school children is quite high. In Kerala, it is almost 100% schooling. Nobody is uh, not going to school, but uh, the number of children who are receiving treatment is very low. Now, how is this happening and uh, what is the uh, problem? That was uh, one issue. Uh, the parent right now the the system is that you know the parents recognize a problem this it could be a epilepsy or some other thing they take the child to a doctor and they make a diagnosis of epilepsy and uh, the prescription medicines are given the child uh, may go back to the school and uh, the teachers are not uh, oriented to it the teachers uh, i have heard many of them telling uh, look here uh, you take all the medicines once you are cured you come back to the school so uh, till that time you don't have to come back to the school and that is a very really wrong way of uh, their uh, ignorance in that field so their uh, educational opportunities get truncated at that point of time so this is because the lack of uh, knowledge on the side of the teachers on in the in contrast to that if the teachers uh, take an initiative in it if they know that you know in my class or my school there are so many children with uh, epilepsy are they taking medicines regularly are they coming to the school regularly how are they doing in their uh, education and training so their participation in the epilepsy care along with the parents can make a lot of difference so this is the reason we the children spend about eight hours in the school that is half of their awake hours. So the parents and the children, are, teachers are equally exposed to the problems of the child. There is bullying, stigma effect, and so many other social issues related to epilepsy that happen in the school. None of these things were being addressed. So that is why we thought of starting something called the a school epilepsy program where the teachers will be involved. We, as you were also part of it, we are the entire uh, Sri Chitra team. It was a great experience, you know, every day, three teams going in three different places. We, we surveyed 50,000 children from 27 schools. It's a big number, <laughs> not a small number. And that too, I think in a one month period, no, we did not so take much time. One and a half months, yeah. One and a half month time. Every day was everybody, one team will stay in hospital and two teams will be outside. That's the way we worked. And I congrats and credit to all my colleagues in doing that great job. And uh, we could actually convince the government about, uh, they wanted actually to escalate it at a much wider level, but uh, then there were some issues related to funding and other things it could not be done and I hope one day this will come through in Kerala state as a school participation in the epilepsy care. There are school counselors now in schools. They also are as social workers who are who are earlier focused only on uh, you know some issues of uh, psychosocial issues of children and uh, they were also educated about the epilepsy related problems and how to tackle it. Yeah, I think uh, taking neurology and epilepsy care to the grassroots has been a vision of yours and uh, uh, I found that an extremely novel uh, enterprise to really take up with regard to you know expanding comprehensive epilepsy care at a more holistic level. Uh, one of, uh, one of my experiences when I joined also was the very fact that you asked us to deliver uh, sessions and teaching classes to interns. And the very fact that, you know, you could 
uh, you wanted to improve uh, the understanding of epilepsy among in, uh, interns and potential general physicians. Uh, that that was a very inspiring thing as well. So, uh, yeah. any thoughts about that? I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, he did that for a few years uh, for MBBS students uh, from different colleges. A one-day teaching program on uh, yeah. serology classification, treatment, the differential okay. diagnosis. Uh, this was all done by you and Ajit and uh, Asha and uh, all of who are at that time present. And uh, it was a great uh, experience. Three yeah, years or four years? I think three years we. Stayed. I think three years we did. Three this, years, yeah. Yeah. But again, as I said, the idea was completely unique and unheard of at that time. I mean, I'm not too sure whether any other center would have undertaken such a venture at that time. Maybe that was a pre-runner for our epilepsy school. <laughs> possibly, possibly. But I mean, that was more focused towards neurologists and electrophysiologists. Yeah. This was like at the grassroots level. So I, yeah. I found that an extremely novel experience. Uh, one of the other uh, aspects was, you know, I mean, when we did came to your presidential oration itself, uh, where you talked about neurology practice at the crossroads. People were expecting that you would be talking more about your experience in setting up a registry, women with epilepsy, but this uh, turned out to be a very different experience altogether. Uh, I know that you're extremely well read, you read uh, much more beyond neurology textbooks, you do, you do read a lot of fiction as well as non-fiction, any books of which have proved to be inspirational for you. Uh, you were talking about uh, CRISPR as well as gene editing and I think that topic was uh, an important uh, uh, you know, area which really uh, sort of picked your interest with regard to clinical genetics. So any thoughts about that? I mean. Which books would you recommend to a general neurologist or a subspecialty neurologist who just wants to think out of the box? <laughs> <laughs> I must uh, admit my limitations here. I don't have very much read nowadays. Um, books which are uh, of substance, which might influence us in our uh, thinking and other things. I think uh, one of the, I think it's a very essential thing. Uh, but uh, reading uh, newspaper Hindu is a general uh, source that, uh, you know, it gives a lot of uh, uh, scientific input and uh, different philosophies and uh, I enjoy reading the newspaper Hindu and uh, the weekly issues, uh, editions of that. And uh, many of uh, some of the thoughts at least uh, I have from that. Um, that is one thing uh, about uh, um, CRISPR and new things, you know, I think uh, um, for quite some time, neurology had been quite um, introspective, looking inside only, they are not looking outside. Into, there are so many exciting things within the neurology, neurons and the other things, okay. but we probably were so excited about all those things that, you know, we were uh, not uh, keeping ourselves abreast with uh, what is happening elsewhere. Um, I was a um, professor, visiting professor in uh, Columbus, uh, Ohio State University uh, for a, as a Fulbright fellow, uh, professor. You know, that gave me an opportunity to visit many institutions in the US and give lectures. Uh, if you are a Fulbright professor in US, you know, you get uh, invitations from universities to come and give a lecture. Oh. So that was a sort of a passport for me to visit uh, several, uh, I think, Columbia University or uh, Long New York uh, Hospital, Mayo Clinic, and so many places. And uh, one of my uh, experience was that, you know, I was attending a research meeting in, uh, in the, this happened in Columbus only uh, on Charcot Marie tooth disease. This I am talking about 2020, 2010, 2010. Uh, they had an experimental model for Charcot Marie tooth in which they were giving this uh, genetic therapy and uh, the conduction velocities improved, the myelination improved, the power improved in these rat models. So I never heard, I had never heard of such a things. You know, I couldn't imagine that, you know, a condition like charcot Marie tooth will be reversed. 
with the treatment. And this is what they are talking about and this is what they are going to translate into clinical research. Now today we know that you know 10 years down the lane uh, you know so many genetic disorders SMA has come up with the treatment. So many conditions are on the verge of getting a, a genetic therapy which will overcome the barriers or um, biochemical metabolic uh, derangement and uh, make us uh, better. And uh, one such experience was actually one case of Pompey's disease, which we had uh, in uh, treated several years back in uh, Chitra. Uh, this I'll take a long story because it is so vivid in my mind. This child was brought to me in the OPD for uh, difficulty in getting up from uh, squatting. At that time, I think he was might have been around 10 or 12 years of age. So I looked at it and I found that this child was already on treatment for epilepsy, uh, carbamazepine or something he was getting. So he had epilepsy, but much more than he had a cardiac problem. He had a rheumatic heart disease with a aortic uh, valve involvement. So he was a rheumatic heart disease patient. He was an epilepsy patient and now he has come for muscle weakness. So we did our standard workup for muscle weakness and uh, we did the biopsy and we could not come out with any specific uh, uh, diagnosis except that it's a myopathy. Now uh, his father was very very determined to find out the cause for it. Uh, he went on propping into various things and uh, he found that you know there are some metabolic diseases which could be like this. So he contacted the US group which was at that time working on uh, uh, Pompey's disease and they said okay you do this test and see whether this could be Pompey's disease. So we did this uh, along with the help of uh, RGCB and uh, we turned out to be that it was Pompey's disease. But there was no treatment at that time. So this boy was going down and he was admitted to the cardiology with a cardiac uh, failure almost arresting and uh, he was dying. He was dying in the cardiology ICU and uh, when we went in, what's on a ventilator. On compassionate ground, uh, the myosine was given to this child. The first uh, dose was given in the ICU and thereafter it was being given on a monthly basis. A boy who was on ventilator on the deathbed came off the ventilator. Coronary, uh, his uh, elect, uh, echocardiographic functions improved, his ejection fraction improved, he started uh, sitting in a wheelchair, he is now a graduate, he is an em employed, so this must be around 15 years back uh, or uh, close to that. So in front of my eyes I had seen how myosine could uh, reverse the plight and future of a child. And when you see the all the videos of uh, Krishna and, and all the people who have done the primary work in this area, you know, children who were uh, floppy and lying down, started climbing steps and all those things, unbelievable. So we have to realize that, you know, that the type of treatment that we were comfortable with in the past is applicable only for a small proportion. The one, the subgroup which was the untreatable are today going to become treatable and they're going to be the excitement. So we need to really look at that, that aspect. And we, for that, we need to have a good understanding of genetics and metabolic diseases and all those things. Our training need to include all those things so that you know we will be able to handle all those complicated areas. Thank you, sir. I think we are uh, running short of time, but just on a lighter note, uh, having done all this, having achieved so much, can you just tell us a few words about your work-life balance and your hobbies and how has it been? You have a wonderful family. I know Susan, Madam, I know you have two wonderful children, uh, sons, and you're now a grandfather. So how has work-life balance been over the, let's say, 30 years in Sri Chitra? <laughs> Well, it is just, uh, whether it is something worth uh, copying, I do not know. <laughs> um, I used to spend a lot of time in the hospital if I come at 8 o'clock in the morning. Uh, usually it is 6, 6.30 by the time I go or seven, close to 7. That is, uh, we had enough time in the hospital to do our work. 
uh, once i go home uh, you know there is a uh, nowadays uh, my children are away and uh, myself and my wife are only here now so before that uh, you know there was the home chorus we have to go and do the routines for the house all those things are there i don't know whether i did any justice properly to my children and uh, spent enough time with them uh, but it was okay i think they grew up well and uh, they are now in an okay place so uh, my, the question in a philosophical way uh, i would say is that uh, how do we balance our uh, interest in uh, professional job family matters and other personal interests and passions i think that is very important and uh, i have tried to separate out time for my family or my passions to some extent my passions were uh, mostly reading or uh, doing a little bit of photography which uh, i used to go out and uh, spend a few hours or days uh, whenever possible so keeping that time apart is important other side is that even on a daily basis spending some time away from our uh, routine thinking uh, at least a few then the half an hour or more than that is very important my wife maintains a very good garden in front of our house so watching it and uh, she working in that is a uh, another pleasure and uh, looking at uh, how the plants grow and uh, flower and uh, they don't do overnight so i always tell you know it teaches patience to us you can't expect that to flower to come next day so you have to wait 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 and then one day a beautiful flower will come out of it you can enjoy that thank you sir that, that was wonderful and uh, you know I, i think from my perspective your career has been a case study with regard to the fact that leadership and learning are indispensable to each other you cannot separate those two out and uh, i would like to thank you once again for uh, having taken time out from your schedule to uh, tell us about your life and uh, what words would be extremely inspirational to young neurologists budding neurologists residents or what you have actually brought out and uh, i think the academy would be indebted to you for uh the no, the uh, points that you have put out very eloquently and in your typical confident as well as humble uh, demeanor which has marked your career over the years thank you so much and uh, over and out from our side